Hey, this is Jay. And this is Chelsea. Welcome to the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. We are bringing you inspiration to live a more creative lifestyle because our favorite people are the ones that choose the path less traveled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 19. This is Chelsea Alders. This week, we sat down with our dear friend, Maria Brophy. You may remember we had her husband, Drew, on a couple months ago, and we have been so excited to have Maria and hear things from her point of view ever since. Maria is a powerhouse in the world of art. She takes artists that are lost in the world of business and gets their careers on the right path. She chats with us in this interview about their early journey and what that looked like for her and Drew. How she became so wise and walks us through some of the more common mistakes that artists make. I love this interview because not only do we get to see that major shift in Maria's life as she left a full-time job in insurance to become an art guru, just as her new husband's career was blossoming, but then we get to see how she used her own amazing shift to teach others the same path. This interview isn't just for artists, any of our creative entrepreneurs that just don't enjoy the business side, or maybe you do, but you just don't know what is next. This interview will give you a tiny glimpse into Maria's process. And if you love it, buy her book. Link is in our show notes. Let's jump in. Not so fast. (laughs) One more quick thing, guys. If you can listen into the end of the episode, you will hear Chelsea and I give a little commentary, a little bit of insight and kind of what we thought about our conversation. We'd like to give a little scoop on that. And also, if you can make sure to click subscribe right now um, while you're listening, that'll make sure that you are notified when the next episode comes out. Thank you for listening, and please continue to leave comments and tag us and follow us on social media. We love being connected. Now, let's jump in. Hey, Maria, what is up? Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to talk to you guys. I love you guys so much. Oh, we're so happy to have you here. It's been like a long time coming, for sure. It's been like, what, like a dozen years that we've had... uh, had this friendship and know, weird conversations. I mean, how many years ago was it that we were actually in California? That was like a long uh, time ago. Dylan was six. Definitely not a teenager, think, that's or... for sure. Yeah. Probably. Uh, well, yeah, I I keep track of my time with how old Dylan was when something happened. So when you guys first came to California and met us for the first time, I think Dylan was probably yeah about five years old, and he's seventeen now. That's crazy. So yeah, he had, he had his invention book. That's all I remember. He was yes, like so I amazing. He dropped it when we walked in the door. Yeah, actually, something we, I I don't even know. I think I forgot to even mention this in Drew's interview. Is uh, I just wanted to thank both of you guys because you were two of the early people in my art career that kind of like welcomed me into like this niche of uh, of surf art. Um, you guys were very accommodating and welcoming, and like when I was a newbie in the scene and drew had been doing this for such a long time you guys were like yeah come on in stay at our house and yeah it was really cool so well it's funny because we had never met in person and drew and i were like yeah let's just invite them to come stay at our house <laughs> sure why i not? mean so you guys showed up and i don't know if you remember this but i cooked this wonderful it was not vegetarian or vegan. That's yeah. right. Had well, fish, I think. well, yeah, because I didn't know. So I cooked this dinner. It was fish because I have a lot of friends who will eat fish, but they won't eat meat. Yeah. I made a salad and thank God I didn't put the goat cheese on the salad. <laughs> I put it on the side of the salad because I thought, well, some people don't like goat cheese. So I'll put it on the side. And then you guys show up and one of you, uh, Actually, yeah, I think it was Jay who said, well, you know, we're vegan, right? <laughs> and I looked at you and I thought you were joking. And then Chelsea <laughs> I hit that. you and, I forgot she, until hit you you and said, she said, you didn't tell them we're vegan. <laughs> <laughs> and <Nope. laughs> I said, that would have been helpful information to know oh. about four hours ago. Oh, my God. We're such a pain <clears throat> in the ass, aren't we? Man? I do remember was- like sitting around, <laughs> sitting around your like campfire so thing in the back. And I remember walking in with a bag of smelly wetsuits from like we were staying somewhere <laughs> yeah. beforehand. <laughs> Yeah, we've been oh in Malibu. For that but, um, that was yeah. so funny. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so I, I bring that up because I feel like since that moment, like you and I and, and us collectively have had so many conversations that I feel like we're already podcast episodes. So I know I said to Jay, I'm like, this is just like one of like those talks where I know you're disappearing in the 
in the basement on the phone with Maria and I'm going to see you in two hours. Like it's, we're just diving right back in, but I get to be a part of it this time. So <laughs> you get to excited. see what you guys are talking about. <laughs> All your secrets. <laughs> like we have this like cool friendship because like I was telling Chelsea in the kitchen earlier, it's like, you know, Drew and I have the connection of artists and like surfers and whatnot. And then you and I have the connection because I sort of do the job equivalent of both you and Drew for what I do. So like we have that, the, the business artist connection on either side. And then, so it's like when I have business stuff that I want to chat it out with someone, I go to around the, I go around the virtual water cooler with Maria and we have these like conversations and pick each other's brains. Yeah. I, I mean, know. it's like and a I unique, it. it's like a unique thing to like understand business, but then understand art, but then understand them coming together and also just like learning from each other. Cause there's not that many people to talk to about it. Yeah, there's not that many people to talk to. And I know, I know thousands of artists, but there, there aren't that many that I can call and have a true business conversation with. There's really a, a handful of people that I can call for advice or to bounce something off of or just to explore ideas because, uh, you know, I don't really know why that is. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't I know. Really well, know. It's kind of just what's happened in that industry, too. Well, so I think that's kind of where we want to start. We want to talk to you a little bit about um, let's get your story out there and we'll just sort of talk about the history of how you got to this point with just being this mentor for so many artists. And then we'll move forward on. I really want to get some good advice out there for some of the creatives that listen to the podcast. So let's talk about your history, how you got here, and we'll go from there. Okay. You want me to. Uh, give my background yeah so yeah, let's talk so like let's we, talk we know like, you had like a life before this as like a uh, an insurance saleswoman i believe it was right <laughs> yeah like we talked about like oh like pre-kids like i didn't even know if i was gonna have kids i was a businesswoman like i want to talk those days and then we'll move forward okay all right so this is great so in my 20s i was never gonna get married and i was never gonna have children and i meant that for a long time and this is five years ago it. right <laughs> Right. Something like that. Something <laughs> like that. I don't tell anybody how old I am anymore. <laughs> so, <not> important. <laughs> but uh, I was in the insurance industry and it was an okay gig. I got paid really well and I learned a lot about business. I learned a lot about marketing and I learned a lot about sales. So it was a great it was it was a great primer to go into the art business. I never planned on going into the art business, although when I look back to when I was a teenager, I always wanted to be a writer and I always wanted to be involved. I, I thought the music industry was something I wanted to be involved in because I always imagined myself being an agent. A and I imagined myself being an agent to musicians. I could see that. I never, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because it was something I thought about a lot as a kid and a teenager, but I had no role models of any sort. Um, I, I, I actually grew up in a very violent household, a very, um, I, I grew up very poor. There was a lot of violence and abuse in my house. And really, I was just trying to survive. So, the dreams that I had were just pipe dreams and I really shoved them to the side for most, for the first half of my adult life. It was more about survival. And so I, I eventually found my way into the insurance industry, which was a good primer for me. And then when I met my husband, Drew, he was 25 years old. He was painting surfboards for a living. And something clicked with me. I mean, really early on in that first month of dating him, first of all, I was, I was obsessed with him. I was in love with him the moment I met him. And it took him a, a year to figure out that he was in love with me too. Aww. But I didn't. <laughs> was it, so, all right. So like, was, was he like, was he like your type back then? Or was he like just this new kind of guy that you never had met before? Oh. He was my type 2.0 because I always liked long haired guys because I love rebels. I love people who don't let society tell them what to do. So I've always been attracted to the maverick and Drew is a maverick in every sense of the word. Yeah. And so, um, and on top of that, he was very masculine, very strong, very muscular, very, 
uh, badass, you know? And so that was very attractive to me, but he was also incredibly intelligent. And the first night we met was at a party and we sat up until three or four in the morning in this long conversation. I can't even remember what it was about, but I remember it was really deep. And I thought, wow, you know, I can really talk to this guy. But then as I got to know him, I saw how talented he was with art painting surfboards for a living. And I thought, oh my gosh, this guy is not even scratching the surface of what he can do with his art. And so I was immediately trying to help him with his marketing. And it was just like this progression of, look, I think I can get you media exposure. I think I can help you do this and that with your art. And then, um, and he let me, he's like, yeah, whatever you want to do, go ahead. I don't care. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, how long into the relationship before you were like trying to like, be like, I'm going to you know, make this like an empire and help you out. Like it was this, I'm imagining like dating some new chick and she's like, I'm going to do all this stuff for you. And like, was that like really fast or was that like a year into it or? I would say, I, so a year into it okay. was, you know, we, we broke up. Um, I went away. I went on a four month trip around the world. And while I was gone, he uh, decided we were broken up. Uh. And <laughs> That's what a, a maverick. Scandal- <laughs> oh my God. A whole scandalous story in itself. But um, I remember I called him from Australia and I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going to be um, in Hawaii in a couple months and maybe you can meet me there. And he said, well, you know, I'm dating someone else. And I said, what? And so, so of course I broke up with him and he said, what? I can't believe you're breaking up with me. I said, well, you're dating someone else. <laughs> so, um, so a couple months later, I'm in Hawaii and it's the last part of my trip and he tracks me down and he went to Hawaii and um, he tracked me down there. This was days before cell phones or, you know, some people had cell phones, but yeah, this was like 1997. And so I went and met him on the North Shore to, to have an official face-to-face breakup since we broke up over the phone. And that was when he told me, he said, look, I, I don't really feel I'm old enough and ready for this, but I don't want to lose you. So can we spend our lives together? Oh my And gosh. I was like, I was like, Oh my God. So a breakup yes. turned into like an unofficial <laughs> marriage proposal. You're like you want to break up or get married? Which yeah, one? Let's do it. That's exactly what it came down to. So <laughs> go big that, or go home. That yeah, sounds like true. That sounds like true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And from that moment on that it, it was done. Like not only were we together and we came back from Hawaii and we were looking to buy a house together. We were planning to get married Next thing you know, I took over his bank accounts. I took over his business. <laughs> and he has not looked at his bank account since 1998. Oh that is God. no lie. Like, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I would love to like, not be able to look at it, like not worry. That's, that's Well, this great. is actually why like, I always love the parallel of like you and Drew with Jay and I, and not because like I did not take over that stuff, but... When we got married, it was like the ongoing joke that I'm like, we already have so many legal contracts together. It's like actually hilarious to have like this marriage bond when like all of our businesses are so interwoven at this point. Like we own each other in every other way. So (laughs) it's like almost funny. Yeah, there's no there's no breaking up now. I mean, you guys got to make it work. Yes, exactly. It's too complicated. We're just doing this. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, so you guys are back in California and I'm trying to like line this up with Drew's story, too. So. Now, are you starting to see a shift with his art? Like, this is when he's starting to teach it more. Like, was this the the more shift into let's get the, his style really firm? Like, this is what he's doing. Yeah. So his style at that point was pretty solid and recognizable and becoming well known. And so while I had my full-time job at, in the insurance industry, I was working with him part-time and we started looking into licensing his art. So that was where I really came in strong because I had a good understanding um, of contracts. And 
from my insurance background because I was negotiating contracts with carriers. So I had a little bit of understanding of how that stuff worked, even though it was a completely different business, the principles were the same. And so we decided that we could make more money by licensing his art to have it printed on products made by other companies. So we started licensing it for boogie boards, which was our first big license with Whammo. And we had enormous success with that. And we said, my gosh, like we can take art that's already created, license it to this boogie board company, get paid royalties and You just collect the money and then you go on and create more art and you get more licensees on more products and collect more money. So it was a really big business uh, jump for us. Yeah. And a couple of years later, I quit my full time job, which was really hard to quit um, because it was a it was a good job. People would have killed for that job that I had. But I quit that job and um, started working with Drew full time. And that that was how I ended up getting in the business of helping artists because when artists started seeing how much success we were having, they were coming to me and Drew both for advice. And it got to a point where so many people were coming up to us for advice with the same questions over and over again. In 2009, I started writing a blog under my own name, mariabrophy.com, with my own website, trying to answer all these questions. And then about a year after that, I started doing consulting just on the side. And I still do consulting for artists on the side. And it's and it really is, you know, just a little side business. But what came out of that eventually was my book that I released a year and a half ago called art money and success. And it was, it's pretty much our business model, how we've taken Drew's art in the direction that we've taken it to, to earn beyond six figures year after year for the last, you know, nearly two decades. Yeah. Well, I want to ask in those early days of making that discovery of like, okay, I'm going to license this. Was there anyone in like the surf industry or otherwise that you were sort of modeling after at that point? Like, did you see someone that was leading the charge of that? Or were you guys just like, we're going to try this thing and you were the first to do it? I don't remember seeing anyone else doing it in the surf industry. Not an, not an artist. I don't know of any artists that were doing it yeah. at that time. Not, not that I can even, th- I can't really think of any that are doing it now. I've, I, I've Bill Ogden licensed a few images to Billabong. I think it was, uh, or no, I'm sorry. I think it was, I, I can't remember who. What it about was. like, I just, um, I just, like, um, Phil, like Phil Roberts or like Rick Reitfeld, where were they on the timeline of when you guys first jumped in? Cause I remember in high school, like looking at, um, I think it was some Maui and sons. I think Rick, had a deal with and that was okay. like that was probably my only commercial exposure to like even knowing there was such a, a genre at all just from seeing that so yeah that's a great question rick was definitely some rick and phil were two artists that drew and i looked up to very much and um phil i don't believe was licensing anything he was doing he he was doing one-off designs that were bought by companies. Yeah. So a company would buy a design, but he was giving away all rights to those designs. And then um, Rick Reitveld, as far as I know, with Maui and Sons, I don't believe he owns any of that art. I heard I heard about that. I think he was telling us that. We actually visited their studio after I think it was after your your house. I think and we, we got like a tour in. of his little studio at And the I think time. he told us yeah. about that. Like they I think they they or someone actually owned his own name as a trademark, I believe it was. So that brings us up to a really good subject because I think I want to talk about some of these like biggest you know and common early mistakes with some of these artists that maybe get a little bit because you and Drew could have taken a lot of really wrong turns like in and maybe I know you did take some but 
for the most part, you stayed on this really great path. So do you think it's falling? Is it the contracts that are messing people up? Like, what is it? What are the most common things you're seeing that a lot of these artists come in and they're like, you're like, oh, of course you did that. Everyone ends up doing that. This is how you're going to fix it. The biggest mistake that I see artists make over and over again is not holding on to the ownership of their artwork. And you have to think, so, so uh, for example, Billabong, uh, there was a brief period of time where I re- represented Phil Roberts for, for a few years and Billabong was one of our clients. Billabong always bought the designs from artists outright, which meant Billabong owned all rights to the art. And in owning all rights to the art, they would pay the artist a flat fee for a design. They'd use the design for a season and then never do anything with it ever again. And the design dies because the artist doesn't have a right, a legal right to do anything else with it, which is not, a good business model because uh, particularly, particularly if you're an artist like you, Jay, an artist that has a very distinctive style, an artist that's in it for the long term, an artist that wants to be known for their art. You do not want to be a hired hand. A hired hand is somebody who gets hired to dig a ditch. They get paid for that ditch. And then the next day they wake up and they have to dig another ditch if they want to get paid again. That's what a hired hand does. But for somebody who owns the rights to their art, they can make money off of that art again and again and again for the rest of their life. Yeah, you know what? Like bringing up that story, I don't know if I should mention names, but it's a company that rhymes with Schmellishmung. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot of <laughs> a lot of um, artists that I come across are probably the same exact artists that you come across. People that like randomly Facebook me or like DM me or something, and it's like I understand like why a lot of artists would be impressed that Drew or I or Phil or someone else have gotten some of these like quote unquote like big name deals because you know it is something that's great for your resume and your portfolio and but like. To to look at that from an outside perspective, you think like, holy shit, you're rolling in dough. You're doing deals with this company and that company, and you don't realize most of those companies, not not like narrowing down to that particular one, but most of those companies don't pay for crap. And you basically, you know, artists like Drew or I, we do it, you know, yeah, you do it for some some extra pocket money, but it's also really good for the exposure, but only like you said, if you're getting credit for it. So like when I did, I actually did a couple of things for, for that said company. And to my understanding, the art director at the time told me that I was the only one that they've ever granted legal permission to have my name and signature and copyright remain on the artwork itself because I like held to my guns. I said, you're not using my art unless my copyright is on it, unless my name is legible and on the artwork. And that was like a big deal. It took like a month for that negotiation to go through. But like, like those 15 copies of that contract, remember that kept. Oh, it was crazy. It was a nightmare. And for no money. Like we didn't make very it small. Yeah, yeah. Very it tiny. It was really crazy. Well, I'm really impressed that you handle it that way and you stuck to your guns because what you're doing is you're paving a way for other artists because these companies need to be trained. Here's the thing. Most of the people at companies like that, they, (laughs) they, um, they're, it's not like they're, they're not trying to screw you over. No, they're not. They're, they really don't understand the business model of a professional artist and how would they, because it's not the business they're in. So you're not going to understand it, but you can help educate them. And I feel like I'm constantly educating people at these companies. Um, And I, I take the time to do it because I, I really care about artists. I care about the art business as a, as a, as a whole. I want to see All artists benefit from the work they do. I want to see them succeed. And I want to see change where change is needed. So 
I have a lot of conversations with companies like that where I will say, look, you don't, first of all, when it comes to owning the rights, you don't need to own the rights. You're only using this for a season. Why do you need the rights? I'll give you exclusive rights for a season. Yeah. What's the but point? then after that, all yeah, there's no, you don't need it for the next hundred years. Let me, let me do something with this a year later or five years later. Let me pass it on to my children because my children are actually more important to me than you are. <laughs> and, you know, and when you have children, that's when you really have to think about these things because you have to think about your time. You know, are you going to waste your time doing free stuff for people or cheap stuff for people? Or, you know, if you, you have to make a choice between working late tonight to do something that somebody begged you to do for practically nothing, or are you going to go home to your three kids that, you know, are waiting up for daddy to come home? I mean, think about that. That's what I think about all the time. You know, I think and, um, I was going to add, I think like these kinds of things we're talking about, I hope that like musicians and writers and other creatives are listening to this and translating it <clears throat> to their medium because it's really the same thing. If you're a musician and you're just giving away your music, it's the same lessons that we're talking about here. Yeah. And, you know, and granted, like in the first couple of years, you got to do stuff for cheap. You got to... You know, you may not be real good at what you're doing yet, but you're getting there. So, you you, you know, you're not going to start right off the bat charging 20 grand for a painting or, you know, eight grand for a design or, or whatever. You, you know, you do have to pay your dues, but the mistake a lot of artists make and some of my dear artist friends that are in their 50s, they're still making the mistake of thinking they're paying their dues when they paid their dues 20, 30 years ago. Um, pay your dues for one or two years. Yeah. Do a few things to get that, to get experience or to get traction. Um, so but- that just comes down to us not va- – <laughs> so there's two topics here because I feel like – Art in general is not valued in our society. So we feel like, and that goes across many versions of art, you know, music and everything. But even just like you'll see graphic design artists that are just like giving it away because they're just trying to get their street cred, but we don't value what we're doing. And if you don't value what you're doing, it's the exact same thing for me as a doula. Like there are doulas that will work for free. I'm like, actually, now that I'm charging the rates I should be charging, I'm getting more clientele because they believe that I'm offering a good product. Like you don't realize what you're doing by giving yourself away for free. Well, and a lot of people don't trust free or cheap. You know, it depends on what kind of clients do you want? Yeah. What kind of people, what kind of people do you want calling you? Do you want the, you know, You attract to you what you put out. Yeah, sure. And if you're not charging enough for something, you're going to, you're either going to run yourself ragged or you're going to put out less subpar work because you're going to be rushed. I just talked to an artist the other day, one of the artists that hires me to help him. And he said he's overloaded and, and, and his, he's so inundated with work which is a blessing but a curse and I said well you're not charging enough and he said I know you know I've got a lot of clients that are just grinding me on price and I said look oh and he told me he said he said and what's happening is I'm kind of doing crappy work because I'm trying to do every I'm trying to get everything done Mm. and I'm not doing it to my best the best of my ability and I'm like you know what you need to cut some of those people loose you need to do your best work (laughs) and charge adequately for your best work because you can't do your best work if you're not charging enough. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? It's like with, with uh, value and charging and all these topics also, what comes to mind is, and I know you have a lot, lot to say about this is like building up your, your personal reputation and your brand. Um, When I first got out of college, like illustration was one of my concentrations. I thought that that would be one of the most obvious routes for, someone like myself would like to draw. I figured, okay, I'll be an illustrator. And then quickly you find out, like an illustrator in Manhattan, unless you're really, really well known, you're getting paid like a couple hundred bucks maybe for something that would take you several days. And then, I don't want to say to my surprise, but like um, a nice thing that I found out was a year or two into 
building myself, uh, you know, a brand and building myself a reputation as a fine artist, I was getting um, solicitations from really large companies to do illustration work. And I remember one of my first really big ones, they said, oh, you know, here's this, you know, great uh, illustration uh, project for you to do. It would be on this really well-known product. Um, Is $4,000 enough for you to do it? And I did like, you know, I played it super cool, but in my head, I'm like, what? You know? Yeah. And it was only because I had built myself a name because the art itself, like, especially nowadays with like apps and and websites, like you can find people to do stuff for free. But when like someone like Drew or some of your clients or like myself, we have something more than just the art to offer. We have like a unique style or a reputation that really carries a lot of weight. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. And the reputation is sometimes more important than the art because there are artists out there that are incredibly gifted and talented, but they don't finish things. They are flaky. They're just not reliable. Um, something, you know, be, being able to, being able to produce what your client needs and give it to them on time and be professional is m- more valuable than anything really. And um, gosh, I mean, some, one of my artist friends, he's, he just can't seem to, he can't even, you know, he's not supporting his family. He's not, he, he's just broke all the time, but he's so talented. It kills me. But after doing, um, an art exhibit with him a few years ago at a show, I realized why he can't make it total flake doesn't show up does you know doesn't care about anybody else um just is not reliable so that's really important and then and then on another note like when you get to the level that you and drew are at um where you have a reputation you have a body of work where like people can go on your website jay or they can follow your work and see that you've done work for all these killer bands and you know, just see that you have been consistently creating beautiful artwork for a long time. You're not going away. I mean, this is what you do. This is who you are. And that is really valuable for a company that your work might be perfect for. And I, a couple of years ago, I discovered, oh my God, I mean, I, I mean, when you work with a really big company, like, I mean, huge, and you have exactly what they're looking for, you can charge in the six figures for an illustration project. Yeah. And, and um, one that takes you a couple months. And it's really, I mean, those deals don't come along very often, but when they do you you got to recognize it so you make sure you charge enough because some of these companies like when they go to advertising agencies or marketing agencies they're they're paying in the six figures for yeah, easily artwork mm-hmm. and then those and then those agencies come to you and they're like oh they might be getting a, a hundred grand for it and they're going to offer you 10 grand or less right and they kind of pocket the rest um, I, that's know, just, I just, that comes from like a really deep knowledge of like these industries too. And I think that's, you know, why sometimes you talk <laughs> about moving towards like coaches and people who are going to guide you because it is hard to know all the ins and outs of all this stuff. Cause it took all of us a lot of years to learn it all. Like it's, that's what, you know, it's all just, I guess, earning your stripes when it comes down to it. Um, I want to ask you, so this is the corporate side, but I want to talk to you about the mentality and some of the things you've learned about collectors, just individuals that are, I know Drew has some really amazing collectors and there's people that are just looking for his next thing. But as far as new artists, like I think a lot of people come to us too, like how do you even get to that place where you're, (gasps) you're building a collection for someone? So let's talk about the mentality of like finding collectors and how that happens and all of that. You have to get 
your butt out of your house. <laughs> you <Yeah. have> <laughs> Show up. Yeah. <laughs> get, get your ass out of the house and go, go to live events, create live events, be a part of live events. That's how you start. And yeah. you really have to do that. And if you live in the country, if you live in Montucky, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> then get on a plane or get to, you know, a city Get yourself to where there's people and not just people, but really put thought into who, who the people are that are going to be into what you're doing Yeah, and find a venue that will host an event for you that you, where you can exhibit your work or create one yourself, but you have, you have, that's where you have to start. You got to get out of your little comfort zone and get creative and and figure out how to meet people. And there's, there's a million ways to do it. You don't need a gallery to do it. If you have a gallery, great. Um, but you know, <clears throat> there are better ways. I mean, you so can when, team when, up with, yeah. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, so when people come to you and they're like, well, I've just been pushing it on social media. How do you feel about that? Like, it's still more important to be in front of people as artists, correct? I think when you're starting to grow, all right, yes, you got to get in front of people you, for a number of reasons. One, when people get to know you, if they like you, they like what you're doing, they're either going to become a collector or they're going to talk about your work. They might invite you to be a part of something bigger, a part of something more important. Connections are everything, everything. Yeah. You got to connect with people. Nobody's going to discover you. I mean, not that nobody will. Yeah, some people get discovered off of Instagram. But usually it's like through connections. Like you kind of make your own luck. Yeah. 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 So uh, one thing that Drew and I put some effort into is getting his work exhibited, his new work, his sacred geometry artwork and his artwork where he's right now he's got a new series coming out that he's he calls Ancient Observers. And this series is a combination of, uh, well, <clears throat> this series is basically, it's an attempt to communicate what, what ancient people were trying to communicate through, uh, trying to communicate in the past. So when you go to ancient sites all over the world, there's information that's being communicated um, about the history of the world and, and more more specifically, the procession of the equinox, the cycles that the earth and the, and the, uh, and the stars go through every, uh, 12,000 years, 24,000 years. And I mean, it goes pretty deep. So how do you take these ideas that Drew is really, you know, into studying and, and put them in a visual where your average person could understand it and that's what he's creating so trying to find an audience trying to reach people that are into this sort of stuff what better way than to go to conferences where they're talking about this stuff right so so our first so what i started doing was contacting the promoters uh and of conferences where they're talking about this stuff so next month we're exhibiting some of these paintings from this series at a conference called Observing the Frontier. And it's a conference made up of scientists and physicists that talk about the um, changes in the weather, the changes in the solar, uh, the sun, and how That's it affects so the fun. earth and so forth. <laughs> Speaking yeah, of... And- <laughs> Yep. I'm sorry. I was just, it was kind of like related. So like you're talking about like, like Drew kind of like shifting over his, like his niches, which, which is so important for what you're talking about, which is like finding that audience. And like, even if you're changing what you're known for, you still have to find a new audience. And I really want to dive into the whole topic of niches because like you and I and Drew and other artists listening that are doing this, we you know the importance of of having a niche and having that audience that you can speak to because if you don't speak to a certain niche, you're really speaking to no one. And like I know for myself, for your husband, like finding that especially that first niche to catch on is sort of like a, a key to like entering a portal of success. But I what I found and I know 
you can relate to this, and I know other artists within our genre as well as others that I know, that niche at some point c- can feel almost like you're you're locked in a prison, where it's like you then become known for this thing, and as we do as humans and as artists, we evolve, and we take on other interests and other inspirations. And I know for myself, at times, you know, I want to try painting other things, and I do, never stops me, and your husband's the same way. But can you speak to uh, on that topic of the importance of finding a niche, and then some of the emotional and realistic um, you know, obstacles and and limitations that having a niche also uh, offers an artist. Yeah. So every artist wants to be known for something. They want to be known for their art. And if you are bouncing from theme to theme and medium to medium, and and you know, if somebody lands on your website or your Instagram feed, and you've got all these different unrelated styles and things that you create, you're not going to attract a tribe of fans. You're not going to attract, it's going to be really, really hard to reach a consistent collector base because people like what they like. So um, people who are into surfing, they're going to like your art, your surf art or Drew's surf art. They might like Drew's art and not like your art and vice versa, right? But but they're going to like the the theme. Um, knowing that, like if you're really passionate about something and that's your niche, it's so much easier to build a tribe of raving fans because then you go to where those fans are. You go to where they are, and uh, what I mean by that, that is you go to their conferences, you um, reach them through social media, you you know through those pages, through those companies that also cater to that niche. Right. Yeah. So then, it, what happens I mean, when you get like too pigeonholed? Like, did you guys struggle popping out of that surf community? Well said, Charles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that is well said. And um, it's, you know, I, Drew and I never really felt pigeonholed in surf. Um, although now that he's creating this other style of art based on sacred geometry and so forth, it's like it's almost like starting over, yeah. Because yeah. it's a new, it's a new collector, and so we're we're starting over. But I, I'm not uh, like just just to give you a couple. It's kind of exciting. It's kind of fun. Yeah. I was just gonna like say just to give you a couple seconds to marinate on that. Like we have like artists that are are mutual friends that shall remain unnamed that mm-hmm. have had conversations with me like with feelings of, hey, I love what I do. I love surfing as an example, but I'm like so sick of painting this same old such and such. And like they have these fans that are buying it. So then it's like, if you have someone giving you money, you feel so stuck to change when really the big picture might be a change is exactly what you need, but it's hard. Which is why I think it's like really cool. And I told Drew this, I think it's very courageous to like jump out so much. So like what he's doing and like, I've never let that limit me either. I've I always experimented with different genres. I think like visual arts in particular is kind of strange because in like music, you don't ever like put a a band in that genre. Like you don't say Pearl Jam is love music or like whatever it might be. (laughs) You say they have a sound, right? Like, or like, you know, I love Dave Matthews. Like you don't say Dave Matthews songs are all about this genre, right? They have a sound. The songs are about all sorts of topics. And then with art, at least like in the realm of art that we're involved in, it's like totally different. Like you can't just take Drew's style, for instance, or maybe you wouldn't recommend someone take their visual style and just like you said, put it across the board. But like, that's what bands do all the time. It's weird that like a lot of artists can't just have 
a visual style and then just paint whatever the f they want. It's you know like what you I mean? Like, you only do ballet dancers, so don't try to start like painting right. lions. It's like like Picasso happen. didn't follow that rule. He just yeah. painted like whatever the hell he wanted. You're right. It's- yeah. Well, this is the way I think about it. So using the surf art as an example. So you're getting tired of painting surf images with, you know, a a big wave and a surf shack on the beach, which is like Drew can paint that every day and sell it every day. Yeah. Yeah. And and he does get sick of painting that. But we are so grateful that that pays the bills. Right. Totally. And 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 it doesn't mean that he can't paint other things. I mean, he recently did a painting with chickens <laughs> and roosters. <laughs> and <laughs> oh my god, first of all, I had three people fighting over buying the original and then I sold <laughs> Chicken a art. bunch of prints of it and I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I thought I can't believe people love this painting so much. Um it was really shocking to me, but you know, it doesn't mean that he doesn't paint other things. He does. And he, and so you can, but if you have something that's your bread and butter, um, pay those bills, you know, you, <laughs> you yeah. can, you can abandon it if you want, but, um, be grateful for what you have. It's like a, a, a music, a music, a band, right? Tom Petty. I, I remember reading that Tom Petty hated, hates playing his old songs. From I don't know, like won't back down. Remember yeah. that? Whatever yeah. that was. I was just gonna say, oh. <laughs> he ain't playing that. But he had to. He had to because if he goes on stage and he doesn't play some of those old songs, everybody's gonna be pissed off. So you it's the same with the art. Sometimes you have to play suck that it up and play the song, song <laughs> yeah. because your fans want it and right. is it and you're really good at it? You figured thing? out that yeah, you're good at something. Yeah, I know. It's like it's hard to be grateful sometimes, but that's the grass is always greener, right? It's like yeah. I <laughs> let's uh let's, I know. let's switch topics slightly. So like you do you do coaching. I've been doing some creative coaching. We come across different artists doing different things. Can you talk about like realistic expectations? Like I know you are like very skilled and very experienced and you, you, you guys do great and you tell people, yeah, you can make six figures, but like not, let's be realistic. Not everyone can do that. Not everyone is that good. If we're being super honest So like when you come across (laughs) artists that want to work with you or even just in casual conversation and they're, and you're sitting out to a restaurant with someone and they're like, Hey, I want to do this. And you see their work and you're like, eh, like, what are some realistic expectations for people to achieve something closer to success and you know whatever that means for them maybe it means i want to paint more do more music what do you tell people about having realistic expectations do you tell them to have any or just kind of go for it or that is such a good question first of all i'm going to go out on a limb and i'm going to say i really think Almost anyone could make six figures with their art. There are some exceptions um, because I, I don't look when I look at the art that Drew created back when he was a teenager and even when he was 20. If I looked at his art then and said, Is this guy ever going to make six figures? I would have said, Hell no. <laughs> okay. Sure he loves hearing that. <laughs> Um, (laughs) it's not about, it's not just about how good you are. It's about what you decide to commit to and what you're willing to do. And I don't mean, uh, you don't have to do anything that goes against your personal values. It's what you are willing to do. Are you willing to do what it takes? And if you're not, no shame in that. But what it takes is making powerful decisions, thoughtful decisions, taking inspired action. It means investing in yourself. And it means making this financial decisions. Basically, it makes it means making a decision every day that's either going to get you closer to it or farther away from it. Um, So that's, that, that's one part of my answer. And then the other part of my answer is, um, you know, yeah, there are some people that are just, you know, 
some people undercharge, right? They grossly undercharge and it really makes me crazy yeah. when they do that. Um, and it makes me really crazy when Drew's copycats <laughs> undercharge and then try to go after his clients. That That's just maddening. Um, but some artists are just like on glue if they the, their art isn't very good at all and they try to grossly overcharge, then they can't figure out why they can't make it. So the, so you can take things to one extreme or the other. And then like the other extreme is like you could like walk into like uh, any random art gallery in, in a city and look at artists that sometimes I'm like, I think you're grossly overcharging and yet they're making like shit tons of money on stuff that I really don't get. So who are we to judge, I guess, is the point, right? Yeah, and usually that has to do with they're being they are being spoon fed to a wealthy set of people by uh influential people in the art world who who are influencing for their own personal game. But that's a, that's a whole nother game that's being played in a, in a certain sect of the art world. So if you ever see an artist where you go, Oh my God, how is it that guy's painting sold for a half a million dollars? And it's like crap. That's, that's why. Yeah. That's a great topic. So I was going to ask you this later, but I'll spring it on you now. So <laughs> we've like uh, danced on this around this topic like uh, more times than I can think of over the past do- dozen years on uh, social media of various forms. And the topic of uh, the hot button of the topic usually starts out something along the lines of "What is art?" <laughs> Go. <laughs> <laughs> art is anything. You, you know where that... I'm going with this, right, Marie? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what is art? Well, is everything art? Art is whatever you think it is. <laughs> art is subjective. It's to the person. You know what I think is art. What do you, all right? What do what do you think is art? To me, art is a visual representation of an idea. Or concept that, and for me, art that I enjoy is art that I enjoy looking at that makes me feel good or makes me think about something or that just looks great. So I guess that goes back to makes me feel good because when I, when I walk into my house, there's a piece of art hanging above my couch and literally every day I feel good when I look at it. So d- can something fit within your definition that you how you described what art is or what art is to you that looks like shit to you? <laughs> like can you walk in and see like uh a piece of fruit balancing on a stick with like a piece of duct tape and like a Fritos bag on it and it's standing on a pedestal and it fits within that definition of how you described it and you're like, "Yeah, I don't like it, but it is art or it, is anything not art?" And you don't have, I'm not like trying to put you on the spot. I just think it's a topic I'm really fascinated by. So we asked asked David, what was his name? David. Uh, David. We asked David Smith. David Smith, this who owns a gallery. And he said, he thinks that art is anything that spoke, that sparks an emotional reaction. That's basically. And that like, that gets a reaction to me. Yeah. It it gets, it gets me so like (laughs) frustrated because I spent like my life, like studying the craft of art. And I think there's no other, I've said this a million times. There's no other medium with creativity where there's like, seems to be no bar whatsoever there's no standard like you can't take a, a a violinist and say well i i'm playing the violin even though i've never played it before yet i am expressing my emotions and i am making a statement and even though i've never held a violin before this is music here you go like the, but in art in visual art you can do whatever you want and as long as it has a statement or does something that you can write about in a creative way all of a sudden that's art but like you can't do that with like culinary art you can't do that in dance like i couldn't go put a tutu on and be like i am a master ballet dancer because i am going to express myself well chelsea's looking at me like yeah maybe you could (laughs) you know where i'm going with that you you just you just gave me such a visual (laughs) i'll send you a picture later yeah it's his next painting (laughs) oh my god well, Art, I think art's fucking of, weird. 
there's a lot of people that are just full of shit out there. That's my thinking. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. But you know what? But but hey, I, I kind of I wouldn't want to change that because I wouldn't want to change that idea that anything can be art because one of the things I love about my life every day being in this business is that I can just make shit up every day and I don't have to follow <laughs> any rules. But it has <laughs> to work, true. right? But it has to but, do something. It has to make sense. It has or to come. be successful in some way. But I don't, you know, I don't want to follow rules and I don't think there should be rules in art. And what I find interesting about this topic is that the same people who call, you know, urine in a glass in the middle of the room, a piece of art or whatever that <laughs> was. <laughs> Dadaism, um, yeah. <laughs> are the same people that have all these massive roles on, on art. To me, that's a big conflict. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, like um, almost like by saying it has no different definition to their to their example gives a definition. Yeah. All yeah, right, it's... we'll let you off the hook on that one. <laughs> what else you got, Chels? <laughs> well, so I actually wanted to talk about, um, I'm going to rewind us a little bit because I found, and I'm so interested to hear how this journey was for you in the beginning, in the early years, um, because this was an ego thing for me for sure. But I found in the early years, and as you know, like I was running other businesses at the same time as like Jay's career was sort of taking off. And I found a big like, the wife of an artist thing because like almost a defensive role in there because the amount of times you're at shows and it's like, so you're just the wife. And like, I want to wanna talk a little bit about that, like rising up as a couple and watching, like, obviously we're there helping them succeed, but that role, like what that looks like for you in the beginning. That is so awesome. You brought that up. You know, I'll never forget one day, Mark Longnecker brought some friend over. Hi, Mark. Hey, Mark. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember this guy's name, but he brought some guy over years ago. And the guy's sitting in our backyard and we're having tea. It's like the middle of the day. And the guy looked at me and he goes, so what do you do all day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I make salads with goat cheese on the side. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, oh, you know, I just go to the beach all day. And I, I just left it at that. Like, I just thought it was so funny because he didn't realize that I run everything. Yeah. So it's a great question that you asked, because when I when I gave up my career to work with my husband, work for my husband, as my friends put it, yeah, I had sure. a couple friends pull me aside and say, what the hell are you doing? You're giving up your life as this powerful businesswoman to, um, to, to, to be like a promo girl. Husband, yeah. <laughs> to, to, you know, to follow your husband around the world doing this and that. And I said, you really don't get what I'm doing, do you? this is a business that I'm building. Like this is a challenge. This is what I was made to do. Yeah. This is when I was a teenager and I dreamed of being a manager of a band, really what I dreamed of was building up the career of an artist and knowing that I had a skill set to be the behind the scenes business person. And you know, looking back at that, I, I really believe that, you know, as kids, we kind of know what yeah, we're what meant we're to do, for. but we might not be able to figure it out for years later. Um, so I, I never really have a problem with Drew being the center of attention, which he is the yeah. center of attention almost everywhere we go. Um, but I have found that after being his manager for all these years, people greatly respect me. And, and and not that I was ever looking for that, but it really feels good when I hear it from people over and over again. Oh, Maria, you've done such a great job. You know, so I'm very well respected for my work and that and that feels good. So um, I like that. And yeah. I, I don't, I don't feel bad about being in the position I'm in. Right. Well, I think that takes like, and it's, it's, 
It takes like a lot of um a you had a bigger worldview of what you were doing and I think that's really what it comes down to and I remember like that I guess 12 years ago whatever it was like sitting and that was such an inspiration to me because at that point it was like yes we had this other company but we were just all in on the art and for me like we weren't even married yet so it didn't I didn't know what my role looked like I just knew that I was very capable of helping him get there and like to watch you doing it I was like this is a role like this is a role I can put my feet into and like help with you know it was like very inspiring my Ma- Maria you're definitely like not you know on the sidelines anymore maybe the first year like you said of your relationship with Drew but like you know, you can't claim that Drew was always the center of attention, like so much so. I remember that uh, we were in Australia in 2010. I remember talking to um, a an upcoming, uh, I shouldn't say upcoming, a a surf artist, someone that was trying to do something with his artwork, a surfer, and he met up with me or or saw me or something in in Sydney, and we got to chatting. And when he found out that I knew Maria Brophy, he was like, oh, my God. And he was so stoked that I knew you because he had been following your blog. He's an artist and just was blown away by the fact that I knew you. So you're definitely not um, avoiding the spotlight. And currently, uh, let's see if I got this all correctly. You're a blogger, an author, a coach, a marketeer, a brand guru, an art licensor, an art consultant, a mother, a wife, a saleswoman, I'm sure lots of other stuff I'm forgetting. Um, so, I mean, yeah, just to see what you're doing, it's like crazy because you start out as a support system for Drew, for your husband, and now your stuff, you know, has gotten almost like a cult following around the world. And I'm wondering when Maria Brophy needs a Maria Brophy to help her. Like, what's your, what is your team like if you have one now, or what are your plans to build one? Well, that's a good question. I I do need people. <laughs> I need people <laughs> now hiring. <laughs> um, yeah, I I hire people occasionally to help me with different things, but I don't have a regular person. You don't have a Maria yet. yet. Not yet, no. But I but I do need that. Um, it's going to happen eventually. So, what do you tell people about? Uh, you know, I guess what do you tell artists about that? Because like even even myself, like Chels is busy doing her own empires, and I'm basically doing the job of you and Drew. And most artists are in that spot. So, what are some of like the first practical steps that artists that are solopreneurs? What should we be doing first? Give us give everyone some advice on what's some good ways to implement Maria like greatness by yourself. Well, look for uh, tasks that you hate doing that you have to do over and over again that you can hire someone else to do just on a part-time, part-time, part-time basis. And look for those things that take you away from the work that only you can do, which is the creating and working with clients directly and so forth. So anything, anything that you can outsource, start outsourcing. And the ideal scenario is to find one person and it could be a virtual assistant, you know, somebody that's maybe in the country, but they don't have to be local that you assign tasks to, or it could be somebody local that you meet with once a week or something, but but you really do have to outsource things if you're going to grow. You cannot grow without having a team, even if it's just a part-time person. It's like Chelsea's giving me like the side eye here. <laughs> I'm like, like, keep talking, Maria. He needs to hear it. <laughs> so my, Talk all right, so I'm going to, I'm going to speak for like most, most artists, the majority of us, myself is included in this. So the, I think the obstacle with that is like, I see a lot of businesses, not even just creative people, just businesses where they like dish out stuff to like virtual assistants and their social media or their marketing messages or their text copy comes off so impersonal and foreign robotic sounding that like it seems like a lot of these tasks are best done by someone who speaks your language, number one. 
and someone who really gives a crap. And a lot of times within the budget of most creative people, it's really hard to find someone to do things at the same level as like you or myself. So a lot of times I get stuck or I don't know, I feel stuck doing a lot of those tasks because the idea of handing my marketing and branding off to someone that I can afford seems impossible. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Yes, I know exactly what you mean. And it, it is it is a challenge finding the right person. I've been through a lot of people and I hate to say it, most people disappoint me. Um, I, but you just have to keep looking until you find the right person and the, and the right person is out there. You have to know, first of all, you have to know what it is that you want from a person and you have to write it down. You have to make a list of it because everything starts with clarity. And, um, you may, there may be somebody right on your nose that you're not even thinking of. There, there are people out there that are very capable, that are very reliable and would be great to work with and would be willing to do it on a part-time basis at an affordable rate. Um, there are a lot of people out there. You just have to, you just have to keep working at it until you find it and um, maybe start with, don't start with the most important stuff first. Start with the really simple stuff or like your accounting. I don't know if you do your own accounting, but no. <laughs> that's definitely yeah. one thing we we've uh, dished out years ago. At, yeah. yeah. That we, we pass off. Yeah. Um, good. But the other stuff I just feel like is like, the, our biggest problem, and maybe this is um, the biggest part of really starting to organize all of it, is there's just so many little tasks. So it doesn't feel like eat any or yeah. like for one person. And that's when it. There's like four billion little tasks. Each one of them probably needs a separate type of assistant. And then the idea of like training or teaching someone how to do every minute task is just like completely overwhelming. So, like on the topic, I know you talk a lot about like contracts and trademarks and like protecting your rights. So, like, sort of related topic, what are some of the first things that you would recommend any creative person handle as far as those categories go? Well, for one thing, um, as an artist, you, it, it's really important to file your copyrights. And I know people resist this and I get it. Sometimes I procrastinate on it and then I really regret it. Um, but the thing is, if you, if you get yourself in the habit of filing your copyrights, then when your work is ripped off, you will have a better chance of fighting it. We had a scenario where, um, oh my gosh, I had somebody email me. This was a, two or three years ago. Somebody emailed me an advertisement from a major sunglass company with a picture of goggles with Drew's art on it. And they said, congratulations, you got a license with... <laughs> Were they in Chile? Because I had the same thing happen to me. No, they're an American okay. company. They're oh. giant. Ouch. They're giant. And um Well my guess is they didn't know, right? No, so I said, Oh my gosh, this is not this is Drew's art, but we didn't license it. So right away, because of the size of the company, like a lot of times I handle these things on my own, but because this company is so big and that the, I, they were rolling out these products, they probably had God knows how many tens of thousands of units oh made. God. And I said, there's no way this can go to market. Um, so I got my attorney to send them a letter. And it turns out what happened was they had a, they have a team rider. Their team rider came out with these signature sunglasses and got his good buddy, who's an artist, to do it in the retro surf style. And basically the guy copied one of Drew's waves copied it exact copied it so well oh. that i thought it was drew's wave could have like could have hired the guy and made, yeah. you know, made a little team and not <laughs> so what are the um, repercussions as that like since you did follow through with all that because we've had it happen but then it just got shut down quickly like i know you guys have had it happen so many times but well on a bigger in, scale what happens what's the repercussion for the the copycat 
In this scenario, oh, well, in this scenario, the the company had to, um, the, the sunglass company had to scrap it. So they had to throw all those units away. I don't know how many units they had to get rid of, but it cost them a lot of money. Oh um, the artist, I'm sure, I don't know. We didn't press charges or anything because they took it off the market um, and we let it go yeah. at that. But the artist was, uh, I'm sure it was an embarrassing thing for him. Yeah. And, and it's funny, the artist has a mutual friend that we have and we didn't know. Um, and this mutual friend came to Drew and said, yeah, he's really pissed off. <laughs> And Drew's like, that's what? Ballsy. He copied my art. So <laughs> that's where the that's where things fall through the wayside because that there's just like a non education piece there. I think which maybe that is up to people like you and Jay to m- educate better. I don't know whose fault it is, but artists are like these new artists are just dumb. Like they don't they don't <laughs> know. Like it's like they just copy stuff and then they put it up there and. They, I guess, just assume it's no big deal. It's not even like they're worried about getting caught. They it's just like, like don't. Artists are like kind of doing like a cover song. It's like a yeah. musician. It's like they when think you, whenever... they're paying homage. Yeah, it's I like guess. whenever you learn something, you copy other people. So you're like you learn you learn guitar. And you're like I'm yeah. going to go get a gig doing cover songs, and it's kind of the equivalent of that in a weird way. Yeah, the the weirdest one we had, Maria, not to get because this is such like bad energy to stay on this topic, but <laughs> the weirdest one we have is like, and I think you might have been copying Which Drew's weird stuff one? too There's so many in Monaco. One. Oh, yeah. in Morocco, one of those. Morocco, maybe there was a guy literally painting. So like actually made it look like he was painting Jay's paintings. He's still there. So someday we're going to go to Morocco and yeah, like he sits there with like, I don't know if it's underneath the canvas or what it is, but he literally just replicates and then sells original paintings on the beach. So full replications. Um, oh my gosh! And well, how do you even go? I mean, there's there no way to that even get gallery. to him. There was like a gallery. I think there also, and I think they had Drew stuff too. I I, I believe. Yeah, I think it. we all we dealt had, with it. A we couple had years like ago, messaged yeah. you about it, and every it seems like every six months or a year or two, one of us messages each other. Yeah, they, I saw this about these kinds of things, and usually it's if they get you, they get me, and vice versa. Yeah. Well, with social media, you can really. You you can fight it socially, although negative energy. Like I don't really, I don't like to attack people, even if they deserve it. Yeah. But we had a guy. Okay, so a guy in Australia was doing the same thing, Jay, that this guy in Morocco was doing to you. Um, and one of Drew's fans alerted it to us. So he had an Instagram page, and he so one of Drew Drew painted me a Buddha. So this guy sketched it out. I think he used a projector. Right to like copy right Drew's art. We're giving and people so, all sorts of amazing ideas right <laughs> now. By the way, <laughs> well, and so he was sketching it, and he was saying, "Yeah, look what I decided to do." And he was saying how he came up with this idea, and oh blah blah blah. Gosh. And then he showed the progress of the painting of it, and so Drew commented on it, like, "Hey, that's my Buddha." And so he blocked Drew. <sighs> And then, so then, um, I, so then we made an announcement on Drew's Instagram. Hey, look what this guy's doing. He's, he's copying, not just Drew's art. He was copying other artists too. And, um, pretending like it was his. So many people attacked his Facebook and Instagram page. People get angry when artists do this i know um so it's it's actually kind of refreshing to see that type of yeah like i don't know even just the support of your fans who are in a sense what people don't realize is like your fans are getting ripped off too because what's happening is like oh i paid ten thousand dollars for that original painting and you just bought it for a hundred bucks in in monaco you know like like, it's like ridiculous the social media thing definitely works like i think it's (laughs) obviously it's very important to have contracts but then the other side of it is like you have to have the time and money to fight the contracts but like i've had a lot better luck doing like you just said like i had a um a company a surf company uh, a surf shop in costa rica 
that used one of my paintings without me knowing for like all over their branding. And I was so like pissed. I like put it up online and they got bombarded with like my fans and followers. And like within a week, they had taken down all the signs, changed all they the had branding. To, like, they sent us a picture of like the front of their building with a sign gone. And, you know, they did what they had to do. But it's like you give wow. respect to at least they followed through very quickly with, like with social media owning thug. up to it. But it was the same thing <laughs> yeah. with them. Some guy basically sold that to them as like a like a thing that as if this guy had the rights to sell it to them kind of thing. Yeah, that happens a lot. Um, oh, the, the guy in Australia, though, he ended up emailing me, begging me to take that <laughs> off of Drew's Instagram. <laughs> and so I, d- I said, you got to take everything down, not just Drew's, but everybody else that you're copying and I'll remove it. And so I did. I took mercy on him. I, I kind of felt sorry for him. I, I, <laughs> I know. I, <laughs> the social media thing does get ugly very quick. That one spiraled away from us, yeah. too. Yeah, we got, we- like, attacked for weeks from people being like, did you... What's going on? Did he take it down? Like people were so mad. We were like, the guy oh, was God. like, make it stop, make it <laughs> stop. Know. So, all right, yeah. to ch- change the topic here, a smidge. So, like, you know, you speak to a lot of artists that are starting out or want to take a leap, like you did. Um, I talk to artists like that too. I we actually have a friend, uh, Kevin, who is extremely talented uh, musician, extremely talented photographer and videographer. And he has a really really cushy job, and I'm constantly kind of giving him like a, a bro nudge with the elbow and the ribs. Come on, dude. Um, so I guess the question here is like, so someone is considering taking a leap. So safety net or not? <laughs> Do you have kids? Does Kevin have a <laughs> children? He does. He has two, have- two children that I love a lot. Okay. All right. So give me yeah. the all right the Maverick answer, and then like the more, and then the mom answer. So so here's the thing: if you are single. With no children, take take the leap. You don't need a safety net. It doesn't really matter. You're gonna not having that safety net will force you to make better business decisions, and you will see success from it. Right. However, in Kevin's case, he has two children. He's got a great job. I would recommend taking one foot out of the safety net. Okay, and. I recommend this a lot. And I did this myself before I quit my job. I cut, I took a 20% pay cut and I cut back to four days a week for, for, for a while before I finally quit. And, um, I've advised other artists to do this. One artist I work with, he, he's, he was an engineer, very hard for him to quit his job. I said, so why don't you see if you can come back to three or four days a week? Because he was already making some money off his art. And so we knew that it was viable. And so that's what he did. He proposed to his boss to take a um, pay cut and cut back to three days a week. And his boss let him and he did that for a year. And then he finally quit and has been a full-time artist for a couple of years now. So that's what I would recommend to somebody that has a lot of uh, mouths to feed to take a pay cut. So may, and, and don't tell me your employer won't do it because if you come up with a very strong proposal where you show them how the work is going to get done, I mean, put a lot of thought into it. Okay, if I, if I take a two-day-a-week pay cut... I'm only going to work three days a week. This is what I propose you can do with the uh, two days of work that I'm cutting out. And I think, you know, there's a good chance they'll say yes and do that for a year. And then uh, you'll probably be ready after that. Mm. What about um, the topic of self-sabotage? Like when you come across people that just are constantly just knocking themselves off the pedestal and they, they have great opportunities and they're just like, eh, I'm not good at business. I don't know about accounting. I don't like social media, blah, 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 whatever it might be. When you come across artists or creative people that are just constantly creating excuses, what's some of your advice that you might give? Some people aren't made out to be an entrepreneur and really making a living as an artist. You're an entrepreneur. You can learn to be one if you're willing to learn, but some people 
if you're not willing to learn, then just accept that it's a, a hobby. Right. And there's and there's no shame in that. There's nothing wrong with it being something you really love and enjoy doing as a hobby. So what I think is interesting about the those that might that might feel it's not even that they're not built for it because I think you can learn to be an entrepreneur in to some respects, but I think what you see as patterns with people that maybe um that's not for them is that they fall into the trap of like they always want to be hired to do stuff. So it's like, like I'll see Jay fight against it when he gets too many like quote unquote clients, like people telling him what to paint for like too many, like in a row. Whereas like, I think if you're not really built for that entrepreneur life, like that actually you fall into a trap of just people are going to tell you what to paint for the rest of your career. That's like what, cause it feels good to have the steady income. Like, does that make sense? Like, it's kind of like two different types of being creative, I guess. Well, there, yeah, that makes sense. And there's two different ways to look at it. One thing is, you know, do you, do you want to live by the brush? Sometimes living by the brush means painting dogs and you're not really into dogs. <laughs> I'm not, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I, and I use that as an example because I met a girl on the beach many, many years ago in South Carolina. I was there on vacation and uh, she was my niece's friend and she was asking me, you know, am I a sellout? Because I'm, I'm always asked to paint dogs and I do it. I get all these commissions, but I don't really like painting dogs. <laughs> she said, but you know, I'm waitressing and I don't really like doing that either. And I said, well, what would you rather do? Paint dogs or wait tables? <laughs> yeah. Right. And she decided she'd rather paint dogs than wait tables. Well, this girl now she's not painting dogs anymore. Yeah. She's a full-time, very successful artist. Um, it, you know, it's, it's just a, a decision to make. But the other thing is, if you're an artist that has a very distinctive style, Jay, like you and like Drew and, um, you know, anybody out there that's, that's kind of, that, that really has a very strong style that's their own, you don't have to paint too many things you don't want to paint. Because when people come to you, they usually come to you because they like what you're doing. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, yeah, sometimes you might have to um, paint themes that you don't really, you're not really into. But you can kind of use that as like a fun thing to do to learn about something you've never studied before and yeah that's and like I, spot on what jay says like if he has one that he's like well like you did that one of like the but the guy riding like a mountain bike a while or a road bike a while ago and he's like i'm not like that into road biking but this is actually really fun to like be forced to paint like the trees the mountains like all that stuff and you had a blast with it yeah like, i mean know? like in that particular example we had like done that biking thing around france yes, was yes, it or you're italy super inspired by italy. it anyway italy italy yeah. for our honeymoon so like i connected with that part of me so i found there's usually connection. something in there to connect with. Right. Yeah. Well, and you know what? I know exactly which piece of art you're talking about. And I loved that piece of art <laughs> that you. you did. I loved it. And I didn't realize it was for a client. And um, yeah, I love it. And, and, and your style, you know, you, you kept the integrity of your style and who you are with that. Yeah. So, Maria, with your career, let's talk about what's going on next. So you um, I know the books are a big thing right now, but why haven't you touched upon more of like the TED Talk public speaking world? Like where is like Maria Brophy center of attention? Where, when's that coming? I've done a little bit of public speaking. Last year, I was hired to go speak at Greenville um, or not Greenville, um, Furman University in Greenville. Okay. So, and, um, and I also sp spoke and taught a workshop at the Makers Summit, also in Greenville. Awesome. And I've done some other things. Um, you know, I would like to do more public speaking. I'm trying to get better at it. I actually get asked to do a lot of different public speaking things, and I say no to a lot of it. Um, partly because when you go give a talk it's just so much work to prepare for it yeah and unless unless it's paying really well I'm just not going to put my time into it um and I'm not ready to focus on that part 
that area as a business yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. You wanna, so if like, you're going to do it, you're going to do it all the way. It's like your style. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why. And it's, it's in my plans for the future. I'm just not read. I'm just not there yet. It's, it hasn't made it to my list of things to do this year. You know? So Maria, we're probably getting close towards the end, but I did want to ask you, as you've built your platform, I know you've connected with some really big people. I've, I don't know details except for the ones that I've like anecdotally come across. Like as one, for instance, like the extremely talented and famous artist, um, Greg Crayola Simpkins, I was talking to his wife, Jen, and I, or I saw, I think, yeah, I think I was talking to her and she had dropped your name or maybe she wrote it somewhere. But in any case, I know people that like that, that are very well-known artists are following you. I'm wondering if like the help and the advice and whatnot has gotten to the point where it's reciprocal, where artists that are, or artists or people in, in the industry in some way um, are fans or followers of you and are now become advisors or coaches to you in some way. No, but I really need some coaching. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? I, you know, I, well, what, I what do you need help tired. in the most? What would you say is your, uh, what are you working on? What's your pain points? Oh, jeez. Oh, well, well, I'm, no one's listening. Let's just be, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Drew and I are, you know, I haven't, so I have not talked about this publicly at all until right now, but we are building a, a, a school called the Brophy Art Academy, and um, it's a combination of of art classes online and business art business classes online. And that is my big thing that I'm working on, and it's going to take me all year to dial this puppy in. And I'm really struggling with it because. I've never done anything like this before, and this there's just so much. But I, but I I just hired a coach, and um, I start working with her next week, actually. So, and I I hire coaches often. Sometimes uh, sometimes I'll hire a coach and work with them for an entire year, um, and sometimes it'll just be for one call. But coaches have always been a huge a part of what helps me grow and propel beyond being stuck. And, um, you know, going back to Greg Simpson, Simpkins, uh, I love him and his wife. I got to meet them in person recently. They came to an event we had here in our gallery in San Clemente. And, uh, and actually they hire me to help them with stuff sometimes. And, um, and and on this topic, you know, one thing that I think artists can really do to help each other is create a mastermind, basically a thing, a thing where, you know, they meet once a week or once a month or something like that and exchange ideas and help each other with growth and getting unstuck and new ideas and sharing information, which is the biggest thing we need to do with each other is share, share inside information that has to do with pricing and how you closed a deal and the details of deals, because that's the thing that we all struggle with the most. I think that's like one of the coolest parts of the surf community too, is like, I think when we first started, we almost expected it to be so competitive, but really what it came down to was like nothing but a lot of really good support. It really was like yeah. a very supportive community. It was like, there's not a lot of you, so why not help each other? Which is like kind of a really Plus you cool... all have like the common interest. We love the ocean. We love surfing. Right. We so love the lifestyle. The and yeah. so above and beyond everything else, we have that in common, which so you have that connection. Which comes down to like yeah. that niche again as Chelsea's coughing. I'll just <laughs> talk over her. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, I'm done with this cold. Um, anyway, so we're there. And I know after like dabbing into your history earlier, I'm like almost afraid to ask this question. But my last question is what's the first memory you come up with when we ask you about your childhood kitchen? <laughs> Maybe. Are you crying? Are you okay. <laughs> It'll be that okay, Maria. That is the Maria. weirdest, weirdest question I've ever been asked. I <laughs> That's what my goal is. Don't even know. We had, we had, we had a telephone with push buttons, and we had a cord, a telephone cord, because you know there weren't 
wireless telephones yeah. back what? then. Yeah. <laughs> we had a cord that was like 50 feet long so we could walk through almost the entire house. We had one of those too. Remember that? <laughs> I, I don't know why that is my memory, but that's like... It's my favorite question. You'd be amazing what, what people come up with. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Maria, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm honored to have you and Drew in like my, my uh, quasi mastermind for like the past dozen years. I like really appreciate like the connection we have, like whenever one of us has a struggle, we're a phone call away and I'm sure everyone learned a, a ton. Yeah, your Can- wisdom is so helpful. I know this podcast is so many creatives just trying to figure out what their next steps are. And like, this is, you're their person. Like they need to hear these conversations. So thank you so much. Can you tell well, us? Um, thank you. I was going to say, can you tell us where we can find you? So where should we follow you and learn from you and all that good and stuff? How can people get in contact with you directly? Go to my website, mariabrophy.com. I have blog posts on there that'll be really helpful. I share pricing strategies on a lot of my blog posts, things that artists really want to know. I, I try to just tell all. And also I offer consulting. And if you go to mariabrophy.com and click on work. You can learn about how you can work with me. And the best value for free is sign up for my newsletter. There is so much value in my free newsletter. I get thank you emails from artists every day. And it's really just me sharing all this stuff that I've learned the hard way for the last, you know, over the last 20 years. So, yeah. um, oh, and, and if I can put a little plug in for my book, my book, Art, Money, Success, you can find that on Amazon. And we will have all like the links of all these things in the show notes as well. So uh, please make sure everyone look in the show notes under the episode and you'll have links for her book and for, for signing up things and looking at stuff and reading things and all kinds <laughs> of good, cool stuff. Thank you so much, Maria. <laughs> this is absolutely amazing. You rule. You crushed it as always. You rock. Oh, well, you guys are awesome. You guys are really good at this. So oh, thank wow. you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're just, it's so nice to have known you guys for so long and have watched you grow throughout, you know, grow, grow in your careers, your businesses, and then uh, grow your family. Oh, I love God. it. <laughs> I'm happy for you guys. I thank mean, you, you guys are, you guys are such a, positive influence and a positive role model for people out there and i love it i love you guys so much i really mean that we love you guys too and we mean that a lot for real we can't wait to see you guys again i know we have to get out there soon that was awesome yeah i love talking to maria she's very relatable and like a good friend and one of the few people that can kind of get our little world i know i just feel like every time we sit down and chat it's like we are kind of falling on that like Let's not get into ranting art mode, but we definitely gave people like a little glimpse of that other side of like what it's like to protect your brand and where the lines are with that, which I really loved. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, really great that we like can give a little peek behind the curtain because on the the superficial level of what we all do, we like show the best sides and there's so much of this like grind and struggle and legalities and all these other things that are going on. And Maria has been so great about kind of shedding some light on that because a lot of artists are extremely ignorant or just completely don't want anything to do with that side of things, but that's a necessary component to doing anything with your art. I know. Were you like just so ridiculously jealous when she was saying that Drew hasn't even looked at his bank account since the 90s? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The idea of like just doing art is like gives me kind of like gets me a little horny. Okay. All right. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one was amazing. I just feel like Maria's insight into like actually understanding how there are flaws in many people's minds when it comes to their own creations. Like we just... One, maybe don't give ourselves enough credit. On the other side, maybe some people give themselves too much credit. And then understanding how to like market yourself outside of yourself is a really complicated thing. Yeah, I think there's a lot of complicated parts of it. I love how they've both prioritized like their lifestyle before anything else. Like whenever we talk to them, it's always uh, all of us, I think, prioritize enjoying life, enjoying our family, 
being able to travel and do things as opposed to putting work in front of everything. I think they're a great example of establishing where you want to live and what you want to do and then basing that at, as the center of your world and then making everything else branch out from that as opposed to most people I think do the opposite. They they figure out like where they live based on work or they figure out all their priorities based on work-related things. This is the opposite way of tackling life and I love that about them. I know. Well, we didn't even get to jump into like that part as far as travel goes but if you guys go back and stalk maria's blog and just see like what they've done in the past 10 years like they've literally i think they spent two years just straight up on the road in those vans that drew so drew did like a project of painting these amazing vans but they use this project to travel the all over the midwest and i guess like canada they went into south america they did a lot of really cool trips in those vans so just like being inspired by like what can be when you come to how can art frame my lifestyle was is always just I love talking to her about it. Yeah, I agree. This was a great episode. I really hope you guys loved it. One thing also that I really loved from this is when she touched upon the idea of having like a mastermind. Um, even though I don't have any sort of established mastermind group, even though I wish I did, they're probably as close to being on the fringes of that for me. And I, I hope I'm the same for them, where you can kind of share inside secrets and little tips and kind of help each other through. There's definitely a collaborative aspect to being a creative person, or I guess even with being a doula for you, like yeah, having no people you your, can, yeah, your creation is having I your guess. tribe is, is important. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I hope you love this one, guys. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks, guys. We hope you loved that episode. Um, if you did love it and could give us some love on iTunes, that would be amazing. You can leave a review and we will give you a shout out at some point on this podcast. Also, if you guys can follow us on social media, we would love to hear from you. We are on pretty much every social media platform at Shifting Perceptions Podcast which is the same as our website, shiftingperceptionspodcast.com. We look and reply to all comments, so please share with your friends, tag us. We appreciate all the love. And don't forget that all of our guests also see all these comments, so I'm sure if you want to just have a space you can reach out, these are the places to do it. Um, we also want to give some love to our amazing photographer that has done all of our photos so far. Kevin Rigby. Kevin Rigby. Um, his website is wavelightstudiollc.com. Dot com. And also our really good friend, John Harvey, who did the music for our podcast. You can find him at Instagram at Harvey Wallbanger. So that's our uh, little rolling credits. We will be back next week.